We would like to just briefly look at one of the most outstanding of uh, New Thought teachers or ministers, one who is not noted so much as, uh, as a theoretician, as uh, perhaps one who has uh, developed the simplest possible way of expressing profound truths. This was Emmett Fox, right here in New York City. Some of you possibly who've been around in, in studying this teaching for a while perhaps studied with Emmett Fox, and I'm sure prize the memory of it. Emmett Fox at one time here in New York City spoke before what was often called one of the largest congregations in the world of a religious audience. He was originally an electrical engineer in England, and uh, there is much that could be said about his background, but the, perhaps the most important thing is uh, he studied with and knew personally Thomas Troward, who we discussed some weeks ago. And he ultimately reflected in the most practical way the Troward concept of mental science. Uh, I would say that, um, that Emmett Fox had the, the uh, engineer's proclivity to get straight to the point. And uh, thus he, he had uh, insights that were very incisive and took points by point, bang, 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 and marvelous truths came out. He was uh, influenced by... Some of the people that uh, certainly I revere, he was influenced by Emerson, uh, by Meister Eckert, many of the transcendentalist poets. He was also strongly influenced by Mary Baker Eddy. And he considered himself a spiritual child of Charles Fillmore. Uh, I was at Unity headquarters during the years shortly after the war when uh, uh, Emmett Fox used to come out to Unity once every year on kind of an annual pilgrimage and talk to the workers, and he always spoke so lovingly of Charles Fillmore and always felt that this was his homecoming. This in no way meant that he was a part of unity at all. He actually was about as individualistic and free as a person could be. He came to New York City and spoke to a few small groups and eventually accepted an invitation to what was called the Church of the Healing Christ, which actually still exists. And he was invited to be the minister in 1931. This was a church that had been built up by Dr. James Murray. At one time, it had had a congregation that was quite substantial, a membership or attendance of something like 1,500 people. But it had gone down to, to a very small group. And I think it's important to know this because some people feel that Emmett Fox just started from scratch and, and took the town by storm. Actually, under his leadership and his uh, very interesting, simple approach, he did attract large throngs of people, and they were constantly moving from place to place, from the Astor Hotel to the Manhattan Opera House to the old New York Hippodrome. At one time, I have various reports of 10,000, 8,000, 6,000 people regularly attending. I don't know what the figure really is. But we know that there was a certainly a phenomena that existed at that time in the Emmett Fox meetings. Eventually, the whole thing settled down to the more serious students, and then for many years he spoke at Carnegie Hall to very large audiences. Uh, Emmett Fox wrote in 1934 the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm sure many of you have read the Sermon on the Mount. Some of you have have uh, perhaps come into this uh, study as a result of someone handing you a copy of this. It's one of the most read books in the New Thought field. Later he wrote, Power Through Constructive Thinking, Alter Your Life, Make Your Life Worthwhile, and Find and Use Your Inner Power. Uh, certainly Emmett Fox is, is best known for some of the beautifully simple, cogent spiritual concepts that... Uh, that are bantered about and used by many, many teachers and sometimes have become cliches to individuals in truth. We've mentioned the idea of the golden key, which we did in our opening meditation. Don't think about the problem, think about God. This is one of the most widely quoted of Emmett Fox's ideas. Uh, business people who are involved in uh, relationships of negotiation, either between companies or in bargaining sessions between labor and management and so forth, he expressed the thought that many have used, and certainly I have, to good advantage, and that is that God is on both sides of the bargaining table. 
the realization that, that as long as you're thinking in terms of, of the division of minds and of people, you, you set up the, the complications and then thereby have to try to bridge the separation which exists basically in your own mind. So his thought was that it was important to try to realize that both or all involved in the, in the disputes or in the discussions all exist in infinite mind, and in the infinite mind there is a right answer through which all persons can be satisfied. God exists on both sides of the bargaining table. He always said that no matter what the problem, you have nothing to deal with but your own thoughts. Very simple, fundamental truth. You have nothing to deal with but your own thoughts. So he would say, get busy changing your thoughts and keep them changed. That's an Emmett Fox concept. Change your thought and keep them changed. Uh, he says, the story of your life is the story of your relations between yourself and God. That uh, This uh, he reflected, uh, as Fillmore did, as uh, sort of an indication of how the Bible works. The Bible is the story of man's life and its relationship with God. And so you can find yourself in the Bible because your life is a story of where you are in your experience in trying to know God. One of the most effective uh, teaching instruments that he used was related to a concept that he called your true place and your right place. And I think this has such great relevance with every person. There's a statement that's often been used in truth, I am in my right place now. And uh, many people have sort of Pollyanna style uh, affirmed this thing without perhaps realizing what it meant. And I think he gives an insight into this which is very helpful. He makes the distinction between your true place and your right place. In other words, the true place, according to Emmett Fox, is where God intends you to be. In other words, your true place is that place that is waiting for you somewhere, a place that no one else can fill but you. It's an ultimate. It's, uh, it's that which you like to think of as the best possible outworking in your life. But he says your right place is something entirely different. He says it is the place that corresponds to your mentality. In other words, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, good, bad, or indifferent, whether you're in the midst of tragedy or injustice or accidents or sickness, laying in a hospital, you are in your right place. Now, that's a startling one, but you see, that deals with the law of consciousness. In other words, he's saying then that, that you are there because that's where you are in consciousness, and you can change your consciousness, and therefore you can get out of that. Your right place, therefore, is, a, is not a static thing. It's a moving experience that fluctuates according to the level of your own mentality. And uh, uh, so that he emphasized even a, even a person in jail is in his right place, you see. In other words, wherever you happen to be, this is your right place. And when you face up to that, then you don't say, well, I don't know, this isn't my right place. I would like to be in my right place. Therefore, you're assuming that you're where you are because of injustices, because of the system, because of people don't like you and so forth. How often we do this in a job. You know, we're sitting in our place of work and, and we say, oh, if I could just find my right place. And usually there is a thought that, uh, that this job is, is not good enough, it doesn't pay enough, they don't appreciate me, and so forth. And therefore there's this terrible resentment and resistance. How much better, according to Fox, that you accept the idea that you're in your right place. You are there because that's where you need to be right now. And when you change your thought about it and outgrow it in consciousness, then you can move on closer and closer toward your true place the place where you can be happy, the place that, that actually meets all of your specifications, all your ideals and all your hopes. But it's a matter of consciousness. As he says, change your thought and keep it changed. He was very, uh, a very uh, interesting person. Uh, Emmett Fox was, uh, was uh, at first appearance, a quiet little Englishman, the kind of person that you might say would always be comfortable standing with his back to the fire. But then once he opened his mouth, he was an entirely different kind of a person. He was very spontaneous, very witty, but the most important thing, very articulate in the simplest possible terms. Again, the engineer getting right to the point and saying things that were absolutely clear. He says, there is no need to be unhappy. There is no need to be sad. There's no need for illness or failure or discouragement. There's no necessity for anything but success, good health, prosperity, and an abounding interest and joy in life. 
As long as you accept a negative condition at its own evaluation, so long will you remain in bondage to it. But you have only to assert your birthright as a free person, and you will be free. Now, that's laying it right on the line. Obviously, some of us say, well, it's not quite that easy. But then you see Emmett Fox didn't equivocate. He just laid it on the line straight and simple. And uh, if you work with it, it works. Anyway, this is Emmett Fox. And uh, if you haven't acquainted yourself with Emmett Fox, I certainly commend him to you. And uh, the, there are several books of his that I think you'd find quite, quite helpful.